actually able to get to the hairdresser. The, of course, the yeah. Factor. That's been way too long. <laughs> so, everybody, this is... I'm getting names mixed up because I've been speaking to so many people. Right Sarah there. McLaughlin. 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 Mm -hmm. Um, she's a naturopath and a metabolic balance practitioner. That's a bit exciting. Um, so she is passion, a passionate advocate that the transition to menopause doesn't have to be horrific. So I am just going to hand over to Sarah. She's going to be talking about the free fundamentals to calm the chaos of perimenopause and before I do hand over that was a bit of a lie um I watched one of um Sarah's webinars that I think she's going to give you as a little gift um so well worth it I was like after about five minutes of hearing her talk I was like I love this person <laughs> go for it Sarah Thank you. I have so much to get through. So I'm going to dive in and get started uh, because I love teaching women about their bodies and helping them understand what's going on so that they can um, be empowered and get on top of that and take control, uh, you know, and have that smooth transition to menopause because it actually doesn't have to be horrific. And then even though that's often what we just get told that's how it is or that's what we see our mums and grandmas aunties going through. If you learn nothing else from me, please know that it does not have to be like that at all. So stay with me. If you have questions, I would love to answer them, but perhaps pop them in the chat or hold them to the end um, because I do have a lot of content. Maybe I'm ambitious. I talk fast, so <laughs> hold on to your hats. Anyway, 4.30 Friday afternoon, this is what you want um, <laughs> from me there as well. So, yeah, we're going to talk about how to calm the chaos here today. So, yeah, you want to smooth those chaotic mood swings. Find your missing energy and mojo. Women tell me this all the time, every day. I don't feel like I used to. Um, and like I said, have a smoother transition to menopause. It's doable. Uh, and you can, you know, naturally deal better with the stresses of life. You don't have to feel overwhelmed or irritated all the time. Bonus from listening to me today, you might also find out why you've gained some extra kilos and maybe not feeling so comfy in your face clothes anymore. So what I will cover is what was really stopping you from that smooth transition to menopause and feeling great in the long term there. It's a really big topic and a very important one. Um, and, you know, the reasons why you're feeling irritated and overwhelmed and have less capacity to deal with life in perimenopause and I will always try and help you and give you some ideas on how to reverse that or undo it so make sure you stay with me through to the end and you'll get that info there as well and we'll be sharing what I think are the three key factors or fundamentals or foundations to help you yeah have a smooth transition to menopause but also um, hack your life you know so you age gracefully and 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 live a long and, and healthy life there as well and i will give you simple things i'm forever the pragmatist i'm very focused on practical help there to help you with balancing your hormones building your stress resilience and and, and tweaking your metabolism there as well so this is this might be you as you're moving through perimenopause you know it's the busiest phase of your life you're not coping so well with stress um, you're irritated, you're impatient all the time. It's like your fuse is like a micromillimeter <laughs> long these days. And it's really impacting your relationships and with your loved ones, um, with your workmates, friends, all that kind of thing as well. It impacts your confidence. That's what women tell me as well at work, in social settings, everywhere, because they feel a bit loose, like a loose cannon. They don't know what's going to come out next. Maybe you're overwhelmed, ultra emotional. Uh, frustrated fed up with everything everyone and even your own body as well like it can be really frustrating what the heck's going on I'm like a trapped this monsters inside me that is always coming out 
and you know you know that it's something to do with your hormones because there's other aspects of your health that are suffering with it as well your period might be really nasty or heavy at the moment your mood your anxiety your skin his digestion I had so many of my clients are starting to be burpy party monsters all the time um, or reflux or all sorts of stuff pops up in perimenopause and we're like yeah like this poor woman here what the heck got no energy anymore I'm just irritated and grumpy I don't even like hanging out with myself <laughs> it's how I used to feel and I know many of my clients and the women I talk to in perimenopause feel the same way too but also feel a bit scared like if I feel like this now how am I going to feel when I'm you know 50 60 70 or or, or whatever um, I know for me when uh, I was having when I started going through perimenopause, you had no resistance, yeah, she's relating hard here. Um, this is how I felt. And I was really frightened. Like, what the heck was going to happen for me in my 50s and 60s if I felt this terrible right now? And this is where, you know, this trope or this idea that we've been told that the transition to menopause, it's horrific. You know, just there's nothing you can do about it. Just grit your teeth and just try and get through it as best you can. I hope it passes quickly kind of thing. But really, the real problem is not like menopause or perimenopause. It's not a pathology. It's not something wrong with us. But it's just that things have happened, like the hormone changes that are happening in our 40s reduce our resilience to stress and they impact our mood and our energy and more. Um, and, you know, your stress levels are really important. They will really heavily influence your longevity, how you age, your, how you reach your fitness or your nutrition goals and how you move through perimenopause and an important thing to think about too is that when we're stressed we seek comfort we want to ease the pain of that stress or distress and that sometimes we're looking at external things to take away the pain of stress like food alcohol smoking or you know often they're very quite negative behaviors in terms of our health but they cause that nice little release of dopamine in our brain that makes you feel good, um, at least in that little moment there as well. And it encourages you to repeat the behaviour over and over again. Your body wants you to have the same result. It's like it's essentially like an addiction. Um, and the pattern becomes wired in your brain and eventually the brain learns to depend on that substance or even just the anticipation of that substance to cope with the stress and it wants more and more of it. I mean, how often are we marketed that we should have wine time in the afternoon or evening because we've deserved it, we've worked hard, life's stressful. And that's what we do and we get used to that pattern and it becomes a thing that you feel relaxed even as you just grab the wine bottle. You haven't even had a drink yet. So, yeah, de-stressing is definitely beneficial for your physical and your mental health, but relying on these external um, factors to cope or to provide comfort ultimately it's not beneficial for you or your hormones or how you move through perimenopause so you know is a smooth perimenopause fantasy or reality am I deluded am I nuts no I don't think that I am and I, I know it actually I'm not because uh, I work with women all the time and help them also have a smoother transition then and you know imagine what it would be like if you you know hormones calm the farm and they stop ruining your mood and stealing your mojo like get up off the couch and you can do the things that you want to do because you're sleeping better you're feeling good and you know you're feeling like you the, of 10 15 20 years ago or whatever it is so um, it's not a wild fantasy. So there's my spoiler a lot there, there. And I'm going to help you understand today some of the things that you can do, the three keys that um, will help you have that smooth transition and really move through um, there. And we're not talking about, um, you know, stress management or building your stress resilience and self-care and my special <laughs> favourite ranty topic, sleep. And so those are the three keys to a smooth perimeno and making that happen for yourself. But first up, who am I? What do I even know about anything? As Vanessa said, I'm a naturopath and a metabolic balance coach. I've been helping women with their health since 2017. Uh, I'm a mum of four kids. I am also a perimenopausal woman. I'm 47. And right now I'm thriving in my life um, despite having uh, multiple autoimmune conditions. Uh, way too many allergies to even talk about 
and having breastfed for over 12 years uh, and, and during 10 years of really chronic stress and trauma that actually saw me gain 20 kilos in less than 12 months, even though like I was doing all the right things. And as a naturopath looking after myself heavily and nutritionally, I couldn't outrun that monster. So now it made, uh, once I've got myself under control and sorted myself out, it made me even more passionate to help women, but particularly those in perimenopause as well. So that's what I do each day and each week. I help women in their 40s master the chaos of those changing hormones, changing body, so they can feel calmer, less stressed and more comfortable in their bodies. And most importantly, make it to menopause without it wrecking your life or your relationships. So this was me 20 kilos ago and a couple of years ago. I um, was feeling crap, to put it bluntly, and I, but I was loving my work in supporting women, although I was feeling quite frustrated because while I could help them in managing their stress and improving their energy and that kind of thing, it was quite supplement and herb heavy. And, um, you know, so it was an ongoing expense. And I also wasn't having much luck with weight loss for me or for them. Um, and I'd tried, you know, all the things, all the diets, all the rest of it. And despite my training, I still don't really, you know, have what I wanted from that perspective. So I quite felt um, I was very burnt out and I felt like an imposter or a failure because I couldn't get the results that I wanted from my clients. And when I thought about it, I was like, well, these diets, they're just a one size fits all. They're not really balancing my clients' hormones, repairing the damage from the chronic stress. And let's face it. Women these days, especially in perimenopause in our 40s, we have a lot of stress and it's the busiest time of our lives. Uh, and often the, you know, protocols or, or diets, uh, they're not really sustainable or compatible with family or a busy lifestyle there as well. So I started searching for the ultimate nutrition tool and I do believe that I found it and I invested my time, my money, trained myself up in it tried it out on myself because I'm my most favorite guinea pig and yeah it reset my hormones my mood my energy I lost 19 kilos in 14 weeks but most importantly I really felt like I'd recovered from the burnout that had plagued me for a few years and as well things like hot flushes sweats and my up and down mood and my my fuse got longer <laughs> more like a half a metre a metre now instead of a millimetre there as well. And so I started using this with my clients as well and some education and coaching around eating psychology and habit change and health coaching and bingo, they started getting great results as well. So this is just a snapshot of me before and after. Um, one of the most amazing things for me and my family was goodbye snoring. I was no longer waking the teens up that are on the upper floor. <laughs> Uh, no hot flushes and sweating. I really actually felt like I got my life back again and I had a chance, um, like a second chance at it and I can actually do stuff and hang out with my kids and help support women in the way I want to because I've got the energy and the clarity of mind and focus to do that. So let's start talking about um, one of the biggest factors that was impacting me and my health and what I see impacting women's health and how they move through perimenopause every single uh, day of my working week. And it is stress. So what exactly is it? Many of you might know uh, or be able to easily identify the stressors in your life and um, what's going on uh, for you with that. Oops. And, um, oh, gosh. I'm never very good with PowerPoint slides, so please bear with me. But um, stress is any stimulus that disrupts your body's internal balance. So it can be physical, uh, chemical, mental or emotional. Um, and I think that women in their 40s today are more stressed on a day-to-day -day basis than, you know, like what our grandparents or our, our mums and our nanas and aunties were. And it's the busiest phase of our life with children, careers, parents, you know, all sorts of stuff to juggle. It's stress and fatigue and burnout seem to be a normal part of modern day life. I mean, everyone seems to know what burnout or adrenal fatigue is these days. Um, and so I wonder if you know, and feel free to pop this in the chat, your answers to my questions, like what do we juggle that they didn't? What's changed in the world that, you know, to increase our stress levels and that zaps our energy? 
Um, and of course, in the last two years, we've had a pandemic and we've had lockdowns to add to this load as well. So we've got the good old C and L words there as well. But I wonder what stresses you out the most? What are some of the things that cause you stress in your day-to-day -day life? And as I said, pop them into the chat there as well. Yeah, so Kylie's saying more pressure on work. Yeah, it's really hard to balance work and life because it feels like these days, I don't know about you, but to me it feels a bit 24-7. We have our phones, we have them with us all the time and we have that pressure and people can contact us. Whereas, you know, in when we were kids, if once you left the house, well, no one could get in touch with you and then it was just when you got back home that you got pressured or when you got to work that you got pressure there as well. So, yeah, there's those major life events um, financial difficulties, injury or illness, um, even traffic jams, they were all stressors as well. Your family, your spouse, your kids, you know, if you've got an explosive child in your life and you're tiptoeing around or walking on eggshells, anyone with teenagers is there with me. Um, I've got two at the moment, so I know that's a big source of stress in our lives as well. But one thing that we don't think about as stressors is things like um, the state of your health or your physical health, or if you've got food intolerances or sensitivities or hay fever or nutrient deficiency, um, even alcohol and caffeine, they can be significant stressors um, on our bodies. And so I guess stress is what I'm not saying. It's not just mental or emotional. It's definitely physical there as well. Anything that triggers our body's stress response to help us survive the threat. Now, when we were primal, primitive beings, that threat might have been a bear chasing us, but um, now most of the time it's a perceived worry uh, or, or fear of something that might be coming up. So let's talk about the three phases to the stress response. We've got stage one, the alarm phase, and this, you know, as your fight, flight or freeze mode, it's really designed to help us get away from that bear. We don't have any bears to get away from. We can't get away from our worries or stresses so easily these days. Adrenaline is released and it helps get us ready to physically run away, but we're not running away. We're still experiencing that heart rate, our blood pressure, our breathing, all getting faster and speeding up. Your blood flow moves away from your um, digestive system and your core and it's sent to your muscles and your brain. So you are really ready to flee the situation there. So important point to note is that your digestive system starts to, well, not shut down, but it's just not as active as it would. The body's focus is not on that. So this uh, stress response is actually designed for bears chasing us or a woolly mammoth hunting us down. It's meant to come, it's meant to go. It's, our bodies in that perspective are still quite primitive and haven't adapted to our modern stressors that are still around. And some of us adapt a bit easier or not, uh, depending on our makeup and, and our genes and that kind of thing as well. So what we have next is stage two, resistance phase. If the stress continues, we go into the resistance phase and we're trying to adapt to the situation. So we have more stress hormones released. Our little tiny adrenal glands that sit atop our kidneys are working hard, making cortisol, adrenaline, DHEA, which is um, a really wonderful anti-aging compound. So we actually would prefer it to focus on that and not stress. Um, and, and those hormones are designed to help us combat stress and preserve our health there as well. Occasionally, we get little spurts of adrenaline to give us the energy when we need to. And it's important to know that cortisol is beneficial in the short term, but chronic elevated cortisol can have really damaging effects on our body and our brain. Um, via, you know, the increased blood pressure and the higher blood sugar, which relates to higher blood uh, insulin. Insulin's a fat storage hormone. So often when we've got ongoing um, chronic stress, we see that uh, abdominal um, fat mass increase there as well. And that's also what drives those cravings for the carbs, that instant energy hit, you know, the chocolates, the chips, that kind of thing. But it impacts your immune system. Your hormone balance is heavily impacted. So I hope you're starting to see how it might be impacting your mood through perimenopause there. And it disturbs your sleep because cortisol and adrenaline aren't hormones that we tend to produce while we're sleeping or having a restful sleep. They're designed to keep us up and alert. Think like that little meerkat on its on the um 
on their home looking all around for danger. That is what cortisol and adrenaline are helping us to be able to do. So they are long-term, those hormones are very inflammatory, especially for our brain and they alter our brain structure and its function there, particularly after months or years in the resistance phase. And that's when we can move into the next phase when your body becomes worn out, um, the exhaustion phase. <clears throat> So your body is exhausted, it's stressed beyond its means. Um, this can contribute to many health crises like I've listed down there. But some of them, those you know, undetermined things that might just creep up on you and then suddenly you're getting migraines every week or headaches daily or you know, you think you're in perimenopause, but maybe you're only in your early 40s and is it, am I too young? Well, it can really muddy the waters there, is, um, whether it's stress impacting it or... Um, the perimenopause in itself. So there's lots of different ways that chronic long-term stress impacts your body and particularly your hormones and we'll talk a bit about, more about that in a moment. First though let's have a, another chat about chronic stress. The, the most common stress that seems to persist in the modern world is that low-grade stress that's always present. It's the one in the background, you know, worries around work, uh, work pressures, deadlines, finances, parenting. Parenting is a huge source of stress for us. And looking after aging parents is also another, so that chronic long-term, um, you know, low-grade worry there for you as well. And it is very detrimental to your energy levels and your overall health there. Our bodies are not designed to be in that constant state of stress response. Our nervous system always wants and craves and needs some downtime from that fight or flight mode. Otherwise, your health will, will start to change and deteriorate. Um, and if you think of all the terms for stress and for burnout and fatigue and stuff like that that are commonly used in our society, you can really see how stress actually is a problem for so many. Like we, you know, we know people that say I'm burnt out, I'll have a breakdown, I, I need a mental health day, I'm on stress leave. Like there's lots of things. We, we know many people suffering from the acts of stress there. And I wonder as well, how does stress make you feel? Um, oh, and so again, yeah, someone in the chat has just said they have food intolerance that they didn't realise they could be stress related. Very often in my experience in working with people, food intolerances, allergies, that kind of thing, often develop because of that suppressing or that um, re reducing the function of your immune system and your digestive system that cortisol and the stress hormones and stress response does. So, yeah, it can. It also can come from perimenopause. So that's why sometimes it can be really confusing. Well, what is it? Maybe it's a bit of both. And um, I'll tell you some more about that today because I actually feel that, yes, it often is a, is a, is a bit of both, but there's stuff that we can do. So don't worry, we will, um, I'll help you sort it out. But just know that, you know, like stress is really insidious. It creeps up on you, I think, and you don't realise how exhausted or depleted you are. Or most women I talk to and I say, are you stressed or you're busy? And they're like, no, no, I'm fine. And I'm like, well, if I came and subbed into your life, for a week, how would I go? How, how would I feel at the end of that? Because we're climatised to the level of busyness and the level of stress in our lives and we forget that actually that's not normal and that's not what our bodies have been designed for. Um, so, yeah, you know, it, it can make you feel anxious, depressed, angry, you know, really ragey or super irritated and impatient. You might find you've got lots to do but you don't know where to start. It's hard to focus. Um, and you worry a lot, but it makes you worry more when you're feeling stressed and it's hard to sleep or maybe you've got palpitations, um, you know, brain fog, got heaps to do, can't get off the couch. You want to sleep because you're tired, but you're too wired. You know, it's all these, um, it's, it's always complicated with chronic stress there as well. So let's have a look at stress in your hormones and, you know, why you are so irritated or feel so irritated. Um, all the time there as well. 
when our body's responding to stress and those little tiny adrenal glands pumping out the hormones for us, it also impacts your reproductive and your thyroid hormones as well. And um, I see people that have dysfunctions in, in one, two or all three of those areas because they've been stressed for too long there as well. And it's because they all share the same control centre in your brain of the hypothalamus and the pituitary. So increased in activity in one gland like the adrenals feeds back to the hypothalamus and the pituitary and it tries to slow everything down um, or, or, and that will impact the estrogen, uh, ovaries and estrogen and your thyroid and your thyroid hormones there as well. So uh, it heavily impacts all of you. And, and you may know or you may not, like as you approach menopause, your body naturally makes less of one of your reproductive hormones or the main players. There's, a, there's many, but I'm just going to talk about the main two today, estrogen and progesterone. Now, as we approach menopause, progesterone naturally declines steadily. Now, we most know that for its role in pregnancy and fertility, but it's actually got a really vital role in cardiovascular and breast health for your amazing skin, hair and nails. Uh, but as a brain and nervous system hormone is what we're focusing on here today. Progesterone really helps regulate our stress response and boost your stress resilience there. You think of it, I like to describe it as your body's own home brand of Valium. It really helps calm your brain and um, through the conversion of progesterone into a neurosteroid called allopregnanolone um, and I will not ask you to ever say that because as you can see I have trouble saying it all the time too but this is why you end up feeling irritated and overwhelmed really easily in perimenopause because you have lower rates of progesterone there and um, we will talk some more about how stress impacts that as well so more progesterone equals a calmer happier you we mostly make, we only make progesterone when we ovulate and get ready for pregnancy or a period. So the less we ovulate, the less periods that we have as we go through perimenopause, the less progesterone that we make. And we can call this the great progesterone plummet. For some women, it'll start in their mid to late 30s as well. Uh, and it's really, it starts to happen when we can actually least afford for it to happen because we are at the busiest phase of our life. And some of the signs that your progesterone is plummeting and your stress levels are perhaps too high as well is that you will find you gain weight, particularly around the middle. You'll not cope well with stress or stressful situations that you used to be just fine with. Um, maybe you'll start getting insomnia, mood swings, anxiety, hay fever, allergies and intolerances, like I said before. Um, autoimmune flares, maybe new autoimmune conditions. This little pony became a celiac at the ripe old age of 42 or 43, thanks to stress and changing hormones. Uh, and night sweats as well. There's a lot can go on. I want you to remember that perimenopause is a very vulnerable time for our body. So it actually really matters how we take care of ourselves and our bodies and our minds because it will heavily influence how you move through the rest of your life. Other times that we've had this vulnerability is pregnancy and postpartum and puberty. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about stress as the health and happiness blocker because it's really what it is. It is one of the biggest blockers to health, happiness and a smooth perimenopause that I see with the majority of my clients. And as I keep saying, women 40 plus are the most um, stressed, the busiest people in their households, but also often the most nutrient deficient. I think that ties in with what Sally Ann was just saying before, that we tend not to focus on ourselves or our own health or getting things or doing things for ourselves. And I see this play out all the time with my clients. You know, we do pregnancy and the focus is on us and, you know, growing a healthy human. And once pregnancies are finished, um, mum moves to the background and our health moves to the background as well. And we focus on our kids and that is definitely to our detriment. Then we get to perimenopause and it shines a light on all those times that we haven't prioritised ourselves and our health. And um, <clears throat> that's when we start to see the changes in our health there as well. So progesterone decline makes us more susceptible to stress. 
So you might have been just fine juggling your, your work, your full-time work and your family and all the rest of it up until now. Now you're just feeling irritated, you're impatient, you're anxious, you're overwhelmed, don't know where to start, don't know what to do next. Um, and like I said before, you can often feel so tired but have a hard time falling asleep or have a hard time staying asleep. Or like Vanessa was flagging, I think in the Facebook group earlier, you might start waking up at the sparrow's part at like 5 a.m. These are all signs of cortisol dysregulation and chronic stress being part of an issue there as well. And remembering it's a bit of a vicious cycle here as well. We have the naturally declining progesterone during perimenopause, but also long-term or that constant or chronic stress exposure uh, decreases your progesterone levels because to make cortisol, your adrenal glands use that same backbone called pregnenolone that your body uses to make progesterone. So it's stealing that pregnenolone from your liver and making cortisol uh, rather than making the precious progesterone that you need. So you've got less progesterone in a time when you actually need it more uh, so that you can have you know, a balanced mood, a regular period or a regular pain-free period even and sufficient sleep because yes, progesterone actually helps you go to sleep and stay asleep as well. So I'm wondering, um, oh, sorry, I just missed in the chat there, the mood swings, Kylie says, yes, yeah, certain foods definitely can make you worse. And uh, yeah, I would say the big hitters are often alcohol, caffeine and, and sugar. Um, but if there's some that are, uh, irritating your body but you're not you know not seeing the impact straight away they can definitely impact your mood there as well um you know and make us have us acting like a giant toddler um, and saying things that we regret later there as well but I wonder if you, anyone else is having any light bulb moments too and understanding now what's been contributing to how you're feeling so do let me know in the chat box if that's you and what you've aha thing moment is there as well so let's have a little talk about progesterone and estrogen and how progesterone we need to keep estrogen in check because estrogen is great it gives us that get up and go it's our assertive molecule you know like it's the gsd we get that stuff done with estrogen in our body and in our lives but too much of a good thing is not a good thing. So we also rely on progesterone to keep that balance in terms of softening and the gentle side of us as well with the bulkiness of the estrogen there as well. Now, this is really highlighted in perimenopause because estrogen doesn't just decline steadily. It goes out with a bang and we get higher than high, highs and low lows, really low lows as well. Um, and so we can feel all over the shop because your mood and your energy and motivation and your stress resilience goes up and down with that estrogen there as well. Um, and you might have heard this call referred to as um, estrogen dominance or estrogen excess. And even if your estrogen levels are pretty balanced or optimal, you can still experience these signs or symptoms of estrogen excess if your progesterone levels are too low. So if you're not perimenopausal and, you, you know, in your reproductive life, if you're going through a lot of stress or distress, and you're, which is reducing your progesterone, you'll still feel these um, signs and symptoms of estrogen excess. And what are they? Well, they're things like PMS, heavy bleeding, irritability, rage, explosiveness, um, weight gain and fluid retention. And one really valuable or useful sign of lower progesterone is actually that breast tenderness or breast swelling that women often start to develop in perimenopause that maybe never had before. Um, and one of the kickers here too is if you know all of that wasn't enough, during perimenopause and, and menopause, when your ovaries are not making estrogen for your body, your adrenal glands are meant to take over the job of making that minimum amount that we need to get by. So I hope you, you know, can you guess what I'm going to say there in that, yeah, if your adrenal glands are busy making cortisol and adrenaline, they're not focused on making that estrogen that your cells, particularly your brain cells, your brain cells are so addicted to estrogen um, that, that they need to keep you feeling, you know, happy, motivated and focused. So, yeah. <laughs> It's not always great. I just wanted to flag as well that the thyroid is another gland that's significantly impacted by stress. 
and a high cortisol suppresses your thyroid function and puts you into that hypothyroid state. So think like everything is slow in a hypothyroid state. It's hard to concentrate. We have trouble thinking, processing information. Your hair might come out a lot more than usual. You're constipated. You feel cold. Um, your skin, your hair dry, slow growing nails and stuff like that as well. What's also really interested is, interesting is it's become a real a vicious cycle because an inflamed or an underactive thyroid will actually cause your body to store more estrogen and then this can put you in that estrogen excess position where your estrogen is really high compared to your progesterone um, and leave you feeling irritated and cranky and less able to cope with life. Also, Excess estrogen is inflammatory in our body, but it also adds to that thyroid dysfunction. So it really gets that cycle going there. And you do need to address both issues, both hormone imbalances, to get that balance and bring you back to where you want to be. So, oh, my gosh, <laughs> I'm feeling stressed, thinking about all the stress and all the things that it's doing for us. And um it's all right. We're going to go through some stuff to help you out and help you and, and deal with it then as well. Yeah, estrogen, except that estrogen imbalance definitely is that the rage is too much of that good thing. It can make you really agitated there as well. Okay, so really important thing point that Narissa has raised there. Often when we go and get, I think, our hormones tested, particularly your thyroid, you'll be fine because everything is normal but the normal range is really broad and it's actually developed of people going in for a test and they're generally unwell they're not healthy well people so uh i when i look at people's bloods i'm looking from a very narrow optimal range that's designed just for women as well and if you're outside of that range you'll very much feel like you've noticed lots of those different symptoms that I just flagged before but if, the, if you're talking with your GP and they're using the lab ranges you'll be fine and you're normal um, and, and you know everything's just fine you're only tired because you're a mum or something like that is what gets trotted out of them. When we look at things from an optimal or a narrow range that's best for health, it gives us the opportunity to identify dysfunction or imbalances before they become a pathology or something really wrong. And we can then use the power of food or herbs or nutrients to um, get things back in track. So, yeah, Narissa, it's really, it's almost like gaslighting because you're like, I feel this way and I know my body well and I feel really terrible. I know it's not me. But then you're also being told, oh, it's fine, it's normal, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, so you start to question, well, is it, you know, just me? What is going on? So that, you know, some of the main systems that get impacted by stress uh, and uh, how we, you know, how, and, and how we feel is really the digestive system, but your brain, your happiness, your mood, uh, your immune system, if you're that inclined to develop allergies or autoimmune conditions, you're more likely to do that if you're under high stress. Definitely body composition and weight gain is a massive thing. And particularly in perimenopause, as estrogen and progesterone change, we're more susceptible to putting on weight because we're more likely to become insulin resistant. And stress can enhance that as well, that gaining weight. Um, it puts us in a fat storage mode, not a fat burning mode. One of the biggest things, though, is that chronic stress uh, and, you know, the new cortisol and adrenaline, they're nutrient heavy or demanding. So if you imagine like your little adrenal glands are a car, cortisol and adrenaline are the fuel. The more you push on the accelerator, so the more stress in your life, the more fuel you'll use and the faster you're going to run out of fuel. So it's the same with your nutrients. Your adrenals need nutrients like your car needs fuel. The stress response depletes that. And it also takes the focus of, the, of your liver and other parts of your body off making hormones to help you feel happy and calmer and more balanced. So it's really important to get on top of our daily stressors and remove some of them um, if you can and if and necessary. But I know often it feels like I can't. I don't know how to. I, I just literally can't change the stressors. And so this is where it becomes really important for the other two foundational or the keys that I want to talk about today 
to help build and support your body and build your stress resilience and counteract the time that you're spending in fight or flight or freeze mode and counteract the changes to our hormones that naturally happen during perimenopause but that leave you with less stress resilience. So let's dive into the first one, which is self-care. Now, self-care is, you know, it's a hot topic. And we're often told it's massages, mani pedis, facials, that kind of thing. All of them are really lovely and what a lovely time out. But self-care is much more than that, true self-care. Yeah, sometimes, Nerissa, it's nice to see a woman who understands women as well. But just looking at things from a different perspective can give you the answers that you need to see you as a whole and everything that's going on there as well. Um, so, yes, yeah, self-care is a strategy to help you deal with stress proactively. It's about caring for your whole self. So it's physical. Yes, massage is wonderful, but it's mental and emotional. Hello, boundaries. Hello, not overscheduling yourself. Uh, and ultimately, it will move you closer to your goals and keep you in a better state of health. Now, often self-care gets confused with self-comfort, which is more about easing that discomfort than moving you towards your goals. So self-comfort, like I mentioned at the start, is that glass of wine that we have in the afternoon or that third or fourth coffee that you might have there as well or staying up late because, you know, I just want to and I deserve some time on my own, whereas the self-care choice might be actually going to bed at 9.30 because you are tired and need the rest. So self-comfort is very much about short-term gratification, but self-care is really looking after your long-term well-being. So some examples of self-care, I've got them listed here. Oh, they don't actually have to cost money and they don't have to be super hard. They're the little tiny habits that we can do each day to build and support and nourish our body over time. And um, this is all of my clients get um, coaching and get encouraged to build regular self-care habits into their day to help them get to their goals, whatever they might be. And there's never a quick fix for your health or repairing your health. I mean, it's, it's taken you a long time to get to this point. And it's, there's not, it's no such thing as a quick fix. And if someone's telling you there's a quick fix, well, then maybe it's not going to be long-term or sustainable. But I want you to think about self-care as being the turbocharge to your efforts to improve your health and well-being. Um, especially during perimenopause, or maybe just think of it as essential. They really are. One of my clients said that she never really allowed herself me time before, and she used to feel guilty um, if she did anything just for relaxation or just for her. But now she, after me boot camping her in terms of self-care, she can see that um, it's just as important as the food, like eating while you eat and exercising, but the difference to how it made her feel was amazing. She said she felt much happier, more calmer and in control there as well. And that's why I love, um, you know, segueing here as well. One of the things that we can do as self-care is actually eating nourishing food uh, most of the time. You know, we're humans. We live a life in a busy and social society and it's not always going to be nourishing foods or drinks that go in our body, but it's what we do most of the time that helps boost our stress resilience and balance our hormones. And particularly when we're eating nourishing foods that are ideal for us or personalised um, for what's going on in your body, you have all the nutrients, all the compounds that your body needs to build important things like hormones and neurotransmitters to help reduce anxiety, to help reduce overwhelm and irritation, and to help you sleep better and feel more energetic and focused and happier there. And importantly too, to really help ensure that your period is not a horrific part of the month, that it just comes and it just goes without too much drama in your life. So all of my clients get a personalised nutrition plan for them with a list of the foods that are optimal for them and match to their biochemistry. And this is exactly what I did to myself and I use it with all my clients. It's everything that they need in terms of nutrient-wise and it's um, meal timings, portion sizes and other key strategies are all involved in part of that or a part of that to help them get their best hormone balance, build their stress resilience, really prime their body to be in its best state of health. Um, so 
the next step that I want to talk about is, apart from nourishing meals, some other forms of self-care that are really great to build your body's stress resilience and help you move into that rest and digest mode, which is what we're aiming for, to reduce perimenopause symptoms like hot flushes and sweats and, and insomnia or changes in your mood and that. So thinking about mindful breathing, but first, thinking about how you breathe when you're stressed. It tends to be fast and shallow, you know, from the upper chest and through your mouth there as well. One of the fastest and easiest things that you can do to control your nervous system and calm the feelings of stress is slow, deep breathing. And it sounds really simple and quite trite, but actually it really is that powerful. But you must practice it when you're not feeling stressed or in a state of distress so that when you are feeling stressed, you can just slip into that as well. And one of the ways that you can do that is the five, five, seven breath. So you stop whatever it is that you're doing when you're feeling stressed or distressed, you can even do it now if you like. Close your eyes down and consciously breathe deeply through your nose down into your abdominals for the count of five. Hold that breath for five and then slowly exhale for seven counts. Ideally, your abdominal muscles will pull back in as you breathe out to help expel the air fully there. You, know, you want your tummy moving in and out as you do that exercise. Try three rounds and see how you feel and you should notice the difference in how you're feeling. But if you need to do more, you can always do more. You will never um, do too much deep breathing or mindful breathing. And one thing you can do is actually check your pulse while you're doing your deep breathing for that really um, great feedback of how you're doing and what if, what that deep breath is doing for your body there as well. So I want to say that moving your body is really important when you're feeling stressed, but I don't want you to go and do high intensity, huffy puffy, running, flog yourself kind of stuff because that is a stressor and that's going to make you feel worse. What I want you to do is some really gentle exercise that's going to help you metabolise and, and get rid of adrenaline and cortisol but also you know hold and be supportive and nourishing and gentle for your body there as well so go for a gentle walk around the block or maybe do five minutes on a bike uh, an exercise bike or do a ride around uh, the block there as well you might lift some um, some heavy weights or do some swimming or um, some yoga or pilates or even just have a dance in your lounge room and sing really loudly because the bonus with singing is that it stimulates your vagal nerve which is the key nerve for rest and digest so singing humming laughing is really wonderful for stimulating your vagal nerve so um, fun laughter and joy making time for friends making time to have a laugh feeling stressed or distressed Watch something funny, you know, there's so much going on and so much input and news and current events is always everywhere bombarding us. Let's counteract that with some fun and laughter and joy. Hang out with kids, hang out with toddlers, babies. They know how to have fun and have a laugh. And that is what we still need as adults. Play is very important to our brain health and our physical health as well because it helps us release stress and get rid of those stress hormones. So now we're going to go on to the third key for, um, you know, building your health and particularly for having a smooth perimenopause as well. And it is sleep because let's face it, without enough sleep, we're just basically all giant toddlers having different stages of meltdowns and tantrums there as well. Um, now, if you know, as you know, in perimenopause and often or if you're feeling stressed, your sleep is one of the first things to be impacted. Um, and I think that a good night's sleep is the ultimate self-care act and a real big resilience booster. So we need to have seven to nine hours of restful sleep each night in order for our bodies to rest and repair. And without it, that's when you'll, you'll quickly become ill and you'll feel unwell and, and out of balance as well. It's a, a big stressor for the body having insufficient sleep. Getting to bed by 10 p.m. or around 10 p.m. each night is advised because the hours of rest before midnight are worth double than those after midnight. And that's because cortisol levels naturally start to rise around two and that alters your sleep quality and it can cause you to wakefulness or light sleep or early wakening, like, you know, 5 a.m. and you can't go back to sleep then. 
um, there because your cortisol has probably risen too early or too much too early there as well. Packing in as many good quality hours sleeping before your cortisol starts to rise at 2 a.m. really helps you waken and feel more refreshed and less like something that the cat has dragged in. So if sleep is something that you would like to improve, here's some tips to help you do that. I know I am a Grinch when I say that people cut out caffeine and alcohol, <laughs> but honestly, give it a try for a couple of months and see how you go and notice the difference in your cycle if you're still having a cycle or just your general well-being and how you sleep because they can significantly impact your um, insomnia and restlessness, like give you a really light sleep. So don't just think about coffee or tea or soft drinks. Look for the hidden sources of caffeine or stimulants like chocolate. Everyone loves to have a bit of chocolate, or not everyone, but some, many people do after dinner. It can be really stimulating and actually end up disrupting your sleep overnight. Um, you know, I'm not one nice cup of organic coffee or, or caffeinated tea um, in the morning, you know, it's usually not much of a problem for most people, but it's when you're consuming it right through the day, particularly into the afternoon, that it will impact your sleep. And the same goes for that row of choppy after dinner there as well. And, yeah, you might feel that uh, alcohol puts you to sleep a lot quicker, but it's a poor quality sleep. It's not refreshing. It's not restorative. So do try some herbal teas or something like that instead. There's so many lovely brands available in the supermarket and the health food shops these days. Also watching the sweet stuff. So alcohol is very much treated like sugar in the body, but having too much sugar before bed can impact your blood glucose levels and the drop later in the night can be what wakes you up. So um, if you do want to have something before bed or, or even during the night to counteract that, try having a small protein-rich snack before bed, like a few almonds or sunflower seeds or a little piece of cheese there. And that segues nicely into the eating sleepy food, which is things that contain tryptophan, which is a precursor or a building block for serotonin, uh, one of our neurotransmitters that gets turned into melatonin, which makes us go to sleep at night and stay asleep. Food tie and tryptophan, uh, things like fish, so salmon, tuna, sardines and cod have the highest amounts, poultry, nuts and seeds and legumes there as well. I've also flagged lights out and I'm just going to whiz through the rest because I know I'm getting close to the end of my time with you this afternoon. Blue light surrounds us everywhere. Our LED lights, your computers, your, your phones, all of those things emit blue light, which tells our brain that it's daytime. And so it will make less of the hormones than compounds that you need to go to sleep. So shutting down half an hour before bed, turning off the TV and get yourself a nice gentle bedtime routine to help uh, get your brain and your body ready for sleep. If you do have to work late on your computer or be on your phone, then please get some blue light blocking glasses or use the warm filters that are available on those things so that they trick your brain into thinking that it, you know, it is sunset or and it's nighttime uh, there and it's not blue light that's being emitted. Now, magnesium herbs, other nutrients, there's so many wonderful options there. Do have a chat with a naturopath or a nutritionist, even at your local health food store, to get something that's the right dose and the right form for you, particularly for herbs. Often people say, oh, I tried herbs and it didn't work. Well, it's probably maybe not the right herb for you and what's going on for you and your symptoms, or even the right dose perhaps there as well. There's many wonderful herbs to help reduce your stress or build your stress resilience and also to get you to sleep there as well. But you would really benefit from a personalised prescription of that. Um, foods rich in magnesium are master relaxing mineral. Uh, the dark leafy green veg, cacao, which is in chocolate or hot chocolate, but eat it earlier in the day or eat it at lunchtime. Almonds, legumes and seeds, cashews, uh, buckstrap molasses and brewer's yeast. So food as medicine can be really powerful here as well. One last thing I wanted to talk about is the Goldilocks approved environment. Our thermostat in our brain 
in perimenopause is so sensitive because of the hormone changes that are going on. So it means a slight change in your body temperature, either up or down, will have you experiencing hot flushes or sweats to try and warm you up or cool you down accordingly. And you can get both within moments of each other there because it's just that sensitive. So to get to sleep, easily your body needs a little drop in the temperature and that's why when you have a warm shower or bath before bed you often fall asleep quicker because you get that artificial lifting of your temperature and then a drop of it as well you want to recreate that temperature drop anytime that you want to go to sleep even if it's 3 a.m and you're awake and you haven't want to get back to sleep um, so you know sticking your feet out from the sheets or, or adjusting and taking a blanket off or putting one on so that you are feeling just right, not too hot, not too cold, but just right, just like Goldilocks. I find that bamboo sheets are amazing for helping to regulate your temperature, really environmentally friendly as well, super soft and deluxe feeling as well. They're really lovely for not getting too hot. So sleep can be really hard to come by in perimenopause, that much is true, uh, but following those tips can be really helpful to improve the quantity and the quality of your sleep because it really is foundational for healthy ageing, healthy hormones and a smooth transition to menopause. So just a short quote here to finish, do love yourself enough to set boundaries, your time and energy are precious, you get to choose how you use it. And I would add to that that it's totally 100% fine for you to choose to focus some of your time and energy on yourself and your own health and well-being there as well. So I hope you've enjoyed and found that useful. That was all that I had to talk to you about today. That, um, you know, and I hope that you understand now how stress can be impacting your health hormones and your happiness and how you move through perimenopause I really hope though that you know that you can get through perimenopause without it being horrific and that you maybe have some ideas on what you can do um, for self-care um, to boost your stress resilience and come in that transition there as well um, and if you're looking for someone you know to give you uh, an idea of what's going on what's blocking you from feeling your best or being your best and you want a plan of how to overcome that, you're interested in personalised nutrition and seeing what foods are right for you, then please do reach out for me. I offer discovery call sessions. I have um, some already snapped up the next week, but I have done, got extra available for the women on this summer. Oh, thanks, Kylie. Aww. Um, and yeah, in these sessions, we talk about you, what's going on for you, your health, your challenges, and what might be blocking your best health there. And if I think that you're a good candidate for my program for some personalised nutrition, I'll tell you about it and we can talk about how to get started. So you can apply for those sessions on my website there, akesohealthcare.com.au forward slash book hyphen in. And um, if you go to my website and after you've made your time for a discovery call, do check out my freebie page because there's some extra bonuses there. I know Vanessa is going to share my masterclass for you as well. On my freebie page, you'll be able to access a meal plan, um, my balanced meal formula guide for perimenopause and some extra bonus tips there as well. And that's my gift to say thank you for listening to me today on Friday afternoon. Thank you so much, Sarah. <clears throat> I loved that, but I knew I was going to. <laughs> um, I um, wanted to ask you something, but it's just gone from my brain. Do you know what I wanted to ask as well, though? Yeah. Um, when you said about uh, your brain and, you know, your thoughts and memory and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. did you ever have a point where your brain was all scattered? Because... I feel like, you know, sometimes I'll be thinking along and then my thought drifts out of my head and all that kind of stuff. And I was thinking, oh, well, maybe I need to see Sarah too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. A hundred percent. Like I'd have a billion tabs open on my computer and I'd be working and then I'd go to another tab and I'd think, what did I come here for? And I'd have to go back and start and think about where I was before. And you know what that is? It's actually the, the, the lowering of the estrogen. Um, our brain cells, like estrogen helps us get blood glucose into the brain cells so they can function and, and you know, so we can think clearly. And as our estrogen levels are dropping, there's less of that sensitivity, less glucose getting in. 
So one of the greatest things that you can do for yourself is actually develop metabolic flexibility so that your brain cells are less reliant on glucose and can use fat or energy from fat cells to um, get the energy that they need to be able to process all those thoughts and the things that we're doing there as well. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, I would say that the majority of people watching now and who watch in the future would be like, yes, I need to do that. Because yeah. you hear that so often and even having conversations with people, you know, everybody's forgetting what they were talking about. <laughs> yes. What was the name? Like you forget the name of the person in front of you and they might be a really dear friend and you're like, oh, I've got to get around it. Or I love it when I'm talking to someone who's a, like a woman in perimenopause. I was talking to someone the other day and they're like, oh, I can't think of they're talking, they're stuck on a word and then they're like, ultrasound, it's ultrasound. That's what I wanted, the major excitement that you get from remembering the word. But yes, definitely also related to you know, cortisol and adrenaline levels there as well can impact your neurotransmitters and your clarity of thought. But one of the bigger things that happens to women in perimenopause is that change in estrogen impacting the glucose or the energy that your brain cells are actually getting. The other part of that, though, that's good news is that actually most of the time it passes postmenopause. So mm -hmm. you get, it comes back to you. For some people it doesn't and that's when, you know, balancing blood glucose levels and insulin and being becoming a fat burner as well is really important to help with that clarity of thought and, and staying on focus and, and on task. Yeah. Fabulous. Thank you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. And... Um, <clears throat> Obviously, I will send all the links and all that kind of stuff, but jump to it, people. I, when you said 10 people, I thought, how lucky are you all that are listening live because you're yeah. really able to get in there. Well, there's already three gone for next week, so I guess that's seven for next week, but um, yeah, so jump in quick if you want to talk to me next week. Fabulous, fabulous. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. Can I, I actually work with people from New Zealand. I think it was that Kylie that said that. I just spoke to someone from New Zealand earlier today. So, yeah, because you yeah. do work online, don't you, Sarah? Yeah, I'm, I'm all online. So that's the, um, the COVID gift to me was Bye Bye Clinic and Hello Zoom and uh, working online. So, yeah, I can work with anyone around Australia and in New Zealand as well. There you go, Kylie. <laughs> Okie doke. I'll let you go, Sarah. Thank you so much. And we will see you in the Facebook page yeah. in and around the next few weeks. And I will send everybody your contact details so they know where to find you. Thank you. Thanks, Mel, for those comments. Thanks so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. Pleasure. Thank you. Okie dokie.